Hare Krishna. So, thank you for coming today and grateful to be here to have an opportunity to discuss the Bhagavad Gita. So, coincidentally, the 14th chapter is one of my favorite chapters, probably along with the 6th chapter. So, I'll, as Ganshampu oriented me about this class, I will take the uh, sections and some application based on the sections. So, in context, in the 13th chapter, in the previous chapter, in the 22nd verse, Krishna gives a verse which is considered the bija, the seed of the subsequent six chapters of the Bhagavad Gita. So, 13.22 he states, Purusha prakriti sthohi bhunte prakriti janvunan karanam guna sangosya sad asad yoni janmasu so purusha prakriti stohi, the soul becomes situated in material nature. Prakriti stohi, bhumte prakriti jan gunan, and desires to enjoy the products of material nature. Karanam guna sangosya, and because of association with the three modes, sad asad yoni janmasu, the soul experiences good and bad, not just in this life, but in various species also. So one example which you could use to understand this is like a child sitting in front of a TV and watching a horror movie. The child is safe with the mother and nearby but as long as the child's consciousness is caught in that horror movie, the child will go through all kinds of emotions. Horror, terror, fear, suspense, everything. So similarly the soul is spiritual but Purusha Prakriti he the soul has become situated in material nature by its consciousness. And why the soul becomes situated like that? Karanam Gunasangosya, because of association with the modes. Now what are the modes? That, so that, that is described in this chapter. So in a sense 13.22 is the seed from which the subsequent uh, six chapters of the, five chapters of the Bhagavad Gita will emerge. Just like we have a tree that emerges from a seed. Krishna will talk about the upside down tree of material existence in the next chapter, 15th chapter. So, what that, how is that tree nourished? How does that tree grow? It grows by the three modes of material nature. So, that's the source of the bondage. At one level, the modes are like if you want to continue the TV metaphor. Ultimately, whatever we see on TV or on laptop, it's nothing except certain different colors of pixels brought together to create forms. So depending on how you want RGB or ROI, red, green, blue, red, yellow, blue, whatever you want to use, form you basically three colors are there which combine together to create unlimited forms. And what we see on the screen can create almost unlimited emotions within us. So similarly, the three modes combine together to create various illusions that captivate us. Now the first, uh, this is a brief introduction of the connection between 13 and 14 chapters. The 14 chapter begins with each chapter in the Bhagavad Gita, almost all chapters, they begin initially with some glorification of the knowledge given therein. So generally, if we tell people to do something, you know, please take this there, please take that there. Now we may know how important it is. But they may think, okay, it's not, okay, if I take it, good, if I forget, it doesn't matter. They may not realize its importance. So suppose a doctor is giving some prescription. Suppose the doctor says, okay, you have to do this exercise, you have to do this, you have to take this medication. And sometimes the doctor may say, even if you forget to take all of the medications, you must take this medication. So, or even if you can't do any other exercise, at least do this one exercise. So if something is important, the doctor should not just give important knowledge but the doctor also needs to tell the importance of that knowledge otherwise the subject will not under, the patient will not understand why it is so important That's okay. Okay. so similar okay Hare Krishna Hare Krishna okay fine so the first two verses, Krishna talks about this in the 14th chapter. He says that, I am going to give this knowledge, param bhuyam pravakshami jnananam jnanam uttamam yad jnantuamunaya sarve param siddhivitogataha By understanding this knowledge, which is very confidential, the great sages have attained liberation. 
and the next verse is repeat, repeat the same glorification of the similar glorification of the knowledge and he says idam jnana mupashitya mam sadharmi magatah sarge pi nupajayante pralayena vidhanti cha if get by this knowledge you won't take birth again and you won't be distressed at the time of death but the word of jnana like to focus on here is idam jnanam upashitya krishna is saying by taking shelter of this knowledge ashray is shelter normally we think of taking shelter of krishna but it's interesting krishna is using over here take shelter of this knowledge those who take shelter of this knowledge are saved from the distresses of birth and death so what does it mean to take shelter of knowledge per se actually ultimately we need to take shelter of krishna but the problem is that often we don't feel the need for krishna suppose somebody has a sickness that is not immediately felt somebody may have a terrible disease but sometimes the symptoms don't come so if the patient does not understand how serious this disease is like i had a very advanced tb and i had to take a one year cox treatment at that time the doctor told me after two months your symptoms will subside but please don't stop taking the medication cuz if you stop the symptoms are gone that's why i stop it will resurface again and it will become resistant tb far more difficult to cure so he said that take keep taking the medication even if the symptoms are not there so in order to take the medication we need to take the knowledge first otherwise we won't feel the need for the medication so we'll see at the end of the bhagavad gita krishna takes shall say take shelter of me but before that he is saying take shelter of the knowledge because by taking shelter of the knowledge we will feel inspired to take shelter of krishna and this is a principle we will repeatedly see even if our if our sadhana if our japa our seva our puja whatever we are doing if we have some intellectual understanding of why we are doing it then we can do it with greater conviction if we understand the glory of the holy name we can chant more seriously if we understand that the how krishna is manifesting as a deity is not understand in the sense that comprehend but in the sense that remember or remind ourselves so krishna is saying take shelter of this knowledge and by that you will be saved from distress so knowledge on the path of bhakti knowledge should not be overestimated but it should not be underestimated also for us knowledge is also something which we can take shelter of so that we can take shelter of krishna and additionally taking shelter of krishna can also be taking shelter of knowledge can also be seen as a means of worshiping krishna that's what krishna says at the end of the gita in 18.70 says that adhishyate cha yamam dharmam samvadam avayo gyan yagyena tena ham ishtasyam iti meymati hi at those who study this conversation of ours they are worshiping me with their intelligence so studying philosophy to the capacity that we can is important we shouldn't see that as not devotional service it is very much integral to devotional service so take shelter of knowledge so that we can take shelter of krishna better and through taking shelter of knowledge also we are taking shelter of krishna and then he talks in next two verses about how the soul who is transcendental purusha prakriti stoi that was said in 13.22 so how does the soul come in the material world so it is the mechanism is through his sarvayoni shu kaunteya murtaya sambhavanti ya tasam brahma mahadyoni aham bija pradapita he says i am the seed giving father so it's like a normal procreational process there is the father there is a the mother and there is a the progeny from there the so similar krishna is the father nature is the mother and the soul who is born just like a normal child is has combined characteristics of both the mother and the father and after a child is newborn and both the parents want to see okay what characteristics of mind does he have eyes are like mine nose is like her they are or whatever so the soul presently has a combination as a material side and a spiritual side so the spiritual side is because we are parts of krishna but we are in the material world and thus we have a material side also and this whole chapter will focus on how the material side entangles us and how we can engage with it so that we can become elevated and liberated and then from 14.5 onwards i'll not go over all the verses i'll go some 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 of them to finish in time and if any of you have any so this is the first section where krishna gives the background the importance of the knowledge and how we come under the moves so any if there any questions you can ask or we'll move on so in 14.5 he starts with the introduction of the moves satvam rajastam aiti guna prakriti sambhavan nibadnanti mahabaho dehe dehinam avyam 
So all living beings are bound in the material world by the three modes. So we could use different metaphors for the modes. One word metaphor was a use of colors, the three broad colors which combine to create images. But here another metaphor can be used, guna can also mean rope. So there are three kinds of ropes that bind us. And instead of thinking of these as three discrete ropes, yes there are three discrete ropes also, but these ropes have strands which intermix. Each rope pulls our consciousness in a particular way. So the, the modes, what are they? Uh, there are multiple things, but from our perspective right now we could say that they are the subtle forces that shape the interaction between matter and consciousness. There's matter out there and we are conscious being. So how matter and consciousness interact with each other that is shaped by subtle forces known as the modes. That means the same object, if I perceive it in goodness, if I perceive it in passion, if I perceive it in ignorance, I'll perceive differently. And why is that? Because of the subtle force that is acting. So a simple example could be say three people are sitting in a bus and they are driving. They're, they're traveling and they see nearby beautiful greenery. A person in goodness is sitting in the bus and is trying to read a book and the bus is shaking and bumping and not able to read so well. The person looks and sees, oh, this forest is so peaceful. I could just sit in that peaceful forest and absorb myself in the wisdom. A second person is maybe just watch some movie or is watching some movie on the phone, some romantic movie. And the person sees a forest and sees a greenery and remembers some romantic song that he saw in the movie, he or she saw. And they think that, oh, if I had a partner, I could enjoy so much. It's a beautiful forest. The third person is trying to just doze off and sleep. And the movement of the bus is jolting that person awake. The person looks at the forest and says, such a peaceful sleep peace. I can sleep so nicely. So the same, so there's matter and there's consciousness. The consciousness is the people who are observing. So why the different response? It's because the first person is in which mode? Goodness, Goodness. Sattva. Second is in? Rajan. That is in Sanskrit what? Rajas. And the third in? Ignorance. Tamas. Yes. So you could say the modes are subtle forces that shape the interaction between matter and consciousness. So you could put it another way as some people make things happen, some people watch things happen, and some people wonder what happened. <laughs> <laughs> so these are three modes. People in goodness, they plan, they work, and they make things happen. They do something, they get others to do things. So they are thoughtful. And people in passion, they just they start they start running and doing things, and they do one thing, and then suddenly that happens, and that happens, and that happens. And what is going on? Some people speak to express their thoughts, and some people speak to discover their thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> and when they speak something, hey, I didn't want to say that. <laughs> and then the other person gets offended, and they speak something, and they speak something, and then hey, what happened? I didn't want to. They watch things happen. And some people are there in their own stupor. Hey, what's going on? I wonder what happened. They're just lost in their own world. So this is broadly the three modes of material nature. So Krishna says, he gives the characteristic of each of these modes. And he does that in two places. First, he gives an analytical characteristic. See, analytical means, okay, this is the characteristic over here, this is the characteristic over here, this is the characteristic over here. Just like, mm, so, uh, going back to the earlier example of red, green, uh, RGB, red, green, blue. So, this is the red color, this is green color, this is blue color, Krishna says. So, he says that when the color is, when the, in goodness, there are two characteristics. That's, it's, it's after 14.6, he says that the characteristics are that Tatra Saptam Nirmalatvat Prakashaka Manamayam Sukha Sangena Vadnati Jnana Sangena Chanaka. Since there is happiness, 
there is clarity there is purity so overall the sattva is positive but it can make one feel complacent and comfortable over here sukha sange na badnaati and it can also make one feel superior oh these people are ignorant i know and one delights in the knowledge and stays stuck and talk about this a little bit later then in the next one he says that the mode of passion is characterized by karma rajo ragatmakam vidhi trishna sanga samudbhavam tan nibadnati kaunteya karma sangena dehinam are bound by karma because why there is raga raga is attachment and not is attachment but overpowering craving trishna trishna an alcoholic is completely free come is completely free to choose whether to drink beer or wine <laughs> <laughs> not to choose whether to drink or not <laughs> so when there is trishna there is craving this is that there is a is a amateur say car salesman say that car salesman will make the pitch and like say so sir would you like to have a car so ma'am would you like to have a car mm. but experienced salesman will say so which car would you like to have red green or blue few things take away our freedom as easily as the illusion of freedom When we are given an illusion of do you want this, this, this? Do I want any of this? I don't need a car, maybe. So what the mode of passion does is it makes us feel you have so many choices. Hey, you want to entertain yourself? You have hundred channels. You can have so many movies. You can have so many to watch. But in that overburden of choices, we forget to think whether I need to choose any of these at all or not. So. If somebody tells us don't do this, we will not listen to it. But somebody gives us so many choices, but all of those choices are what they want us to do. So in the mode of passion, we think we are free. I can do this. I can do that. I can do that. But we are driven to do particular things within this area of our attachments. And in the mode of ignorance, we are bound. Krishna says that mode of ignorance is called agyana, ignorance. So Krishna, now after talking about this, I'll come back to ignorance a little later. But let's uh, Krishna then says there's a tug of war going on between the modes within us. So the tenth verse talks about this competition between the modes. Rajas tamascha vibhuya sattam bhavati bharata. Sometimes passion, ignorance are defeated and goodness comes up. Or sometimes, similarly, he says that ignorance is defeated. Ignorance and passion are defeated. Goodness comes up, or sometimes another mode comes up. So like that, there's a pull going on between the modes. So generally, we all, if we observe ourselves, we see that we go through different emotions. And most people today don't know about <coughs> don't know about the concept of modes, but everybody knows about the concept of moods. <laughs> we all have our moods and some people have like incredible mood swings and at one moment they're so happy they seem to like dancing in heaven and the next moment they're so down in depression as if nothing is happening as nothing is going to work so these mood swings why do they happen because the modes are influencing us in different ways so the modes induce the moods within us and one of the things that we understand from the bhagavad gita as we in the 14th chapter is that we are not the masters in our own house we are not the masters in our own house we could say the bodna dwari pure the body like our house but we are not charge in our own house not in charge we we decide to do something but sometimes some people say okay from tomorrow and I'm, i'm going to wake up early in the morning make up the resolution and then maybe one day they do it two day two second day they do it three days they do it four day they come very late is what happened 
I changed my mind. Actually, they didn't change their mind, their mind changed them. <laughs> so, what happened was that we decide to act in a particular way, but we just can't act. And understanding the modes helps us to understand when we understand that we are not our master, we are not the masters in our own house. That doesn't mean that we are powerless. It just means that we have to recognize that we are someone we have to contend with. Contend with means, say if you are working with some other person. Now if you want them to do a particular thing, it's very rare that we tell and the other person will just uncritically obey. They have their own ideas. And then we have to contend with them, we have to persuade them. And sometimes we can succeed, sometimes we can't succeed. So, so there is this, this chapter, the key theme which I would like to, there are many things we can talk about, that there is, we all have to, for dealing with ourselves, we have to have a combination of self-discipline and self-discovery. Self-discipline means, this is what I am going to do, however I feel about it. But, we can't just keep ourselves under our thumb like our own slaves. So self-discipline alone will not work. But there will also be self-discovery. Normally we talk about self-discovery in terms of understanding that I am the soul. Yes, that is true. I am the soul different from the body. But self-discovery also means understanding what kind of body and mind I have. So how this body and mind can work the best. So we make certain resolutions and it's relatively easier to stick to those resolutions. Some resolutions it's extremely difficult to stick to them. Some resolution, even when we are making it, there is dissolution inside. <laughs> you know, I'm not going to do it. It's not practical. It's not going to happen. So then, trying to do that might not be the most productive use of our energy. So self-discovery means understanding what kind, what kind of nature we have, what kind of influence of modes on us is there, and how best to live with ourselves. At one level, we want to change ourselves. But at another level, we want to, we need to live with ourselves while we are trying to change ourselves. It's a simple example. Say if you are driving a car. Now some cars might have a very fast pickup. They can move very fast. Some cars will go literally slowly. Some cars are meant for, you can have a large family going there. Some cars are just like for one or two people. And so different cars are different. So if we have if we have a car which we are driving, we want to feel the car. Okay, how how does how the cars pick up? How are the brakes? Where is this device? Where where is this where is this machine? Where is this? So <clears throat> when if we are driving a car which we a new car which is not yet driven, then first we need to familiarize ourselves with the car. So similarly, we could say our body mind machine is like a car. Yantra rudan maya. So, now, every car can be driven well by expert driver. But even the most expert driver, say, cannot drive, uh, uh, say, a Fiat, the way you drive a uh, Benz. Each car has its own features. So, we have to, so self-discovery is about understanding the kind of car that we have. And this self-discipline is about making sure that we drive the car the best that we can. So some people say, just be yourself. Just be yourself. Some pe there are some people who say, just, you know, everything about you is perfect. So, I am okay, you are okay, everyone is okay. Okay, what do you mean by that? <laughs> what, what do you mean exactly by that? Actually, there is a part of us that is okay. We are souls, we are parts of Krishna. At our core, we all have spiritual potentials. In that sense, there is, there is a lot that is okay, but there is a lot that is not okay also. So, there is one, like, one extreme where there is this total self-acceptance and no attempt at self-transcendence. Self-transcendence means going beyond what I am to becoming a better person. But there is other which is like total self-transcendence and no self-acceptance. I just have something which I want to become and I don't even accept where I am at right. So there has to be self-acceptance so that there can be self-transcendence. 
Just like say if you are driving a car, I have to accept what kind of car I have. Then I can drive that car to the destination I want to go to. So some people are introverts, some people are extroverts. So one example of say self-acceptance could be. See, extroverts are people, the more people they met, meet with, the more happier they become. If they come to a or to a party or a get together with a smile and the more people they meet, their smile becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. And introverts are people, they come with a smile and the more people they meet, their smile becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. <laughs> and then gradually, you know, they just somehow survive. So, introverts are people who get strength when they are alone. It's not that they are anti-people. But it's just that they, they are, you could use the word social stamina is finite. So they can meet a certain amount of people, after that they need my space. So there are extroverts who actually get strength. You know, if they are alone, they'll pick up a phone and call someone. <laughs> I don't want to be alone, I want to talk with someone. <laughs> so each of us is different. And e every person can serve in their own way. So extroverts are very good at networking. Introverts are very good at say work that requires introspection, deep thinking. So depending on the kind of body mind machine we have, we have to engage ourselves accordingly. If an introvert goes because extreme introvert is I will not talk with people only. That's unhealthy. If an extrovert says I'll keep talking with people, I'll not think only. That's also not good. I have to do some introspection also. So <clears throat> Some people, when you are with them, they just don't talk. You talk 10 sentences and they speak one word. You have to push them to talk something. And some people, you have to push them, stop talking now. Enough, enough. <laughs> just be a little silent. Why is there such a chatterbox? So what happens? People are different. And so there is an element of self-discovery. An introvert may not become an extrovert. But an introvert can understand how I can work best with people. See, for introverts, sometimes when they are, uh, if there's too, too many people, for them, some amount of privacy is like oxygen. And if they don't have it, then after some time, they start behaving unpleasantly. They start just becoming, uh, they're not obnoxious people, but they start behaving in a very repulsive way. So if they understand that, okay, this is how I am, so I need my space, I need my time, then they can work better. So basically, if a person is in the mode of passion, for them, if you told, tell them to do very sedentary kind of activities, they will not be able to do it. They need some activity, they need some energy. Without it, they can't function. If, uh, if we have a Brahmana and if we have a Kshatriya, we have a Vaishya and we have a Shudra. And these are not just uh, castes, they are human types. They are broadly. So, if you tell a Brahmana, we have to do fundraising of a million dollars to build a new temple. The Brahmana will say, after you build a temple, you are only going to discuss Shastra. Just discuss it here only. <laughs> Why do you need a temple? <laughs> the Brahmana will not be interested. And the other hand, a Vaishya, if you ask a Vaishya, actually in the Bhagavatam there is a verse which says that, Sometimes, for a higher purpose, if you speak untruth, that's also okay. Where is that verse? Can you find out? There are thousands of verses. Where will I find one verse in the Bhagavatam? Just give your class without the verse. Who will notice? <laughs> <laughs> so, for a Brahmana, if you tell, can you find this verse? Oh yeah, where could it be? Can be in this section, can be in this section. So people often say, don't see problems as problems. See problems as challenges. That's true in terms of attitude. But for a Brahmana to see fundraising as a challenge, it's not possible, it's a problem. <laughs> for a Brahm, for a Vaishya to see Shastra research as a challenge, it's not a challenge, it's a burden. Why do it? So, when we understand ourselves better, how the modes are influencing us, then we can take the challenges that stimulate us. See, for a Vaishya, we have to raise funds. Now we are doing something. Yes, what are we doing in our bhakti? We should do something. Come on, let's move. So, for all of us, 
if we understand our own body mind machine so now for a vaishya to raise funds also requires some amount of discipline for a for a brahmana also to study shastra, shastra requires some amount of discipline <coughs> so self discipline is required for everyone but if you tell a brahmana to do self discipline of fundraising that is too painful and for a vaishya to do self discipline for for shastra exhaustive shastra study that will also not work so that is that's why i said for us to work with ourselves there is a combination of two things what are they self discipline yeah self discipline and self discovery with the whole framework of the mores we have we analyze this to understand ourselves better so krishna is saying there is a stuck off war between the mores within us different mores one more comes up the other mode comes down so basically all this is to understand ourselves better so now krishna has given an introduction of the three modes in the first uh, from 14.5 to 14.9 then he gives a talk about the conflict and in the conflict which which mode is winning the three modes are pulling us so how do we know which mode is winning so there are times when we feel very calm and reflective even a person in the mode of passion there are times when they really want to take stock and think of their life uh, if you completed a big project then let's talk let's uh, have a debriefing to see how it went what we can learn so krishna is saying that based on what kind of thoughts and emotions are rising within you you can understand which mode is rising so yada sattvam pravrdhetu okay, we go that sarva dwareshu dehesmin prakasha upajayate gyanam yada tada vidya vivruddham sattvam ityuta so he says that all the doors of the body are illumined with knowledge that we can understand characteristic of the mode of goodness now the bhagavad gita is a poetry it's a poem gita gita is poetry and poetry means it often uses it has non literal usages non literal uh, characteristic of poetry is various kind of ornaments so here krishna is saying sarva dwareshu dehe smin prakash when all the doors of the body are illuminated then there is sattva does that mean in, in the uh, sattva in a sattva person when they open their eyes suddenly light glares out of them or you look at their ears you see a light bulb inside their ears <laughs> sometimes you have these uh, action movies some people have special powers they open a special eye and some light comes out of their eyes is it like that no what krishna is winning over here is say if there's a big house and there's a door to the house now if in the area of the door there is no light then we won't be able to see what who is coming and who is going out but if there is light then we can regulate if some unwanted person is coming in immediately we'll close the door say if a child is sneaking out or don't go out it's not safe we'll close the door if a friend is coming in we'll open the door so when there is light we can regulate input and output so when krishna is saying sarvadwareshu dehe smin prakash upajayate in goodness all the doors of the senses are illumined by knowledge that means we understand what to take in through the senses and what to give out through the senses so what to speak what not to speak what to eat what not to eat what to see what not to see now there are sometimes those three monkeys are shown do not see bad not hear bad do not speak bad so that is broadly sattvalya but to understand we have to first to do these things we need to know what is good and what is bad so for so in goodness that clarity comes over there so we so when we start feeling reflective that means you can understand the mode of goodness is increasing but sometimes when we decide okay i want to do some introspection but you start doing something and you feel come on i have to do this i have to do that i have to do that so if the urge to act is increasing a lot that that krishna says loha pravrtira aramba karmana avashya manaspruha vajasya tani jayante viruddhe pradarsha so he says actually the the in rajoguna activity just we have to do activity 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 so i have to do this i have to do that i have to do that now that's not bad see none of the modes are bad we shouldn't think the mode of ignorance is bad or the mode of passion is bad all the modes are required what is bad is our getting taken over by one particular mode say when it is time to sleep 
One of the most frustrating things is if you're not able to sleep. Now many people, if that thing works in their life, they just pull a blanket over their face and go to sleep. At least that works. This is not working, that is not working, that is not working, I just go to sleep. But even sleeping doesn't work. <laughs> you're not able to sleep also. It's extremely frustrating then. So, actually, uh, if the mode of ignorance actually doesn't take us over, we can't sleep. Sleeping is quite a mysterious phenomenon. Of course, it is mysterious because sometimes people sleep at the wrong time. <laughs> but the point is that mode of ignorance is also required so that we can rest and sleep. Mode of passion is required so that we can act. Just like all the three colors are required. But using the three colors, what image is being formed? If I'm drawing a parrot, the parrot should be green. But if I combine the colors in such a way that the parrot comes out to be black. Well, that is not proper, is it? So each activity requires a particular mode. So I remember once a devotee that there's a there's a, there's a guest who was coming in Pune to visit and somehow their flight had come earlier. And then we were rushing to receive that guest. So there's the devotee who was a driver. You know, we were the flight had already come to go to the airport. Just walking so gently, slowly. Said, Come on, let's go, we have to rush. He says, no, I want to walk in the mode of goodness. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in general, we should be in the mode of goodness. But more important is that we have to do what we need to do. So sometimes we need to run, we should run. If, now, we, if we constantly keep running and can't stop running, then that is being controlled by the mode of, mode of passion. So, it's, none of the modes is uncritically good, none of the modes is, is entirely bad. It is what is required as a functional combination for our working at a particular time. So, in general, if there is a certain amount of goodness, we can regulate and act effectively. But each mode in its own way is required. And Krishna says the mode of ignorance is characterized. So, you could put the three modes in a simple way as if there is in goodness, there is first reflection, then there is action. I think first, then I act. In passion, there is first action, then reflection. In ignorance, there is neither reflection nor action. There is just illusion. Aprakasho, apravrittisya, pramado, mohaevacha. So Krishna uses these three words, to, uh, shorthand words to describe the three modes. Prakasha, pravritti and moha. So prakash is for which one? Goodness. Prakash means illumination. Prakash is for goodness. Pravrutti is action. Hyperactive. Activity or hyperactivity. That is for passion. And moha is illusion. That is for ignorance. Yeah. So Krishna will talk about this again in 14th chapter again later. So then he talks about these three modes. And in first he is talking about analysis. So in thinking there are two processes broadly. There is analysis and there is synthesis. Analysis is where we divide things into parts. Just like, okay, this is color, this color, this color, this color. Synthesis is where we bring the colors together to create a, a attractive painting. So now Krishna is, so first five verses, from 14.5 onwards, till 14.9, Krishna is talking about the modes in analysis. Now from 14.11 to 14.18, he will talk about the modes in synthesis. How they work together. So he says, when you start when you live in goodness, Krishna says, Krishna will talk from the long term perspective, the long term effect to the short term effect. The long term effect is said that if you die when you are in the mode of goodness, Yida Sattvam Pravrithetu Pralayam Yati Deha Brit Tadottam Vidam Lokan Amalan Pratipadhyate, you will get elevated, you will attain a higher destination. I remember Krishna has said, I talked about 13.22. Where Krishna says, Sad Asad Yoni Janmasu. Based on how the soul gets attached to matter, the soul gets good and birth, good and bad in various species. So that various species Krishna is talking over here. So then he says, in the mode of passion, you will stay over here itself. Rajasi pralayam gatma karasam karmasangi shujayate tatha pralinas tamasi murayoni shujayate So the modes can affect our long term destinies. Where we go after death. But it's not just a long term effect. Then there is 
also various this medium term effect, the short term effect. So then, karmana sukuta syahu, sattvikam nirmalam phalam, rajasastu phalam dukkham, agyanam tamasa phalam. So he says, when you act in goodness, overall, the result will be purification. So there is elevation, which is a long term result. The medium term result will be, those who live in goodness, will it will lead to purification. Sattvikam nirmalam phalam, that is the result. And then, what is the result of passion? Rajasas tu phalam dukkham. This is a, this is a very good phrase to remember. You can repeat it after me. Rajasas tu phalam dukkham. So Krishna says, Rajas, if you live only in the mode of passion, the phala, the fruit of that will be dukkham. It will lead to distress. It is often, you, you see in the material world, the search for happiness is often the cause of the greatest unhappiness. The search for happiness is often the cause of the greatest unhappiness. We can see this most graphically in terms of say people who become addicted to something. They thought I'll drink to go high. But then, what, they get trapped. Now about drinking in a set, first the drinker takes a drink, then the drink takes a drink, and then the drink takes the drinker. <laughs> So, Rajasas tu phalam dukkham. When we act in the mode of passion, we are thinking only, I want what will give me pleasure now? Pleasure now, pleasure now. And eventually, it leads to dukkha, it leads to distress. Agyanam tamasaha phalam. And in the mode of ignorance, the result is tamas. It is ignorance. So, if the mode arises in ignorance, mode, mode itself is ignorance, and it leads to deeper ignorance. <coughs> and then, Immediately Krishna says, so this is a, I talked about long term result, the medium term result, then Krishna talks about the short term result. Saptvam sukhe sanjayati raja karmani bharata jnana maavrutti tamha pramane sanjayatyota Relatively speaking, when we come to goodness, we feel contentment. Okay, things are... There could be many things which will be good, but things are good also right now. But, in passion, this, I have to do this, I have to do that, I have to do that. And in ignorance, there is illusion. There is more and more illusion. So in today's world, which mode are mostly people in? Passion. Passion, yes. Constantly doing things. I have to do this, I have to do that, I have to do that. Now doing things is not bad. It is, the, it is, are we, in, are we consciously deciding to do things? Or are we just being dragged from one thing to another, to another, to another? So, if you're consciously planning and doing things, that is good. But if you just get consumed so cons so much by things that we, that the, as they, as they say, the urgent things take up so much time that we don't have time for important things. Then it becomes a problem. See, why Rajasas Tufalam Dukkham? Because see, in our life, certain things come with inbuilt deadlines. Mm -hmm. And certain things don't come with inbuilt deadlines. And most people in today's world, because we are in passion and going towards ignorance, most people can't work without deadlines. How many of you have seen that when there's a deadline, you start working? And the deadline comes close and you start working very hard. <laughs> Isn't it? <laughs> so we are all deadline driven. And in once, in many ways, the mode of passion is better than the mode of ignorance. In ignorance, we will not do anything. In passion, at least we will do something. Mm -hmm. So, if there were no deadlines, you know, we would be dead. <laughs> <You could say. laughs> Not literally, but we would become inactive. So, deadlines are good. They at least get us out of ignorance to passion. But the problem is that when we are only deadline driven, then there are many things which, in which the deadlines are not so easily seen. Say for example, our spiritual life. Or even our relationships. If you have a job, we have a deadline in the job. If you have certain work to do at home, the work we have to do, there are deadlines for that. Okay, you have to cook food, you have to go to catch your off, catch your bus to go to office. I have to complete cooking the food by this time. I have to do this by this time. So <coughs> there are deadline driven. Generally, what we have to do with things is often deadline driven. But relationships, they're not deadline driven. But they also need to be given time and attention. 
So when we are only in the mode of passion and ignorance, either we don't do anything or we do things and we are deadline driven. But then those things which do not have a deadline, then we neglect them. And often our relationship with Krishna, our relationship with devotees, our relationship with the people around us, people who are important for us, we tend to neglect them. So, that's why sometimes we feel in the mode of passion I can get a lot done. Yes, we can get a lot done. But we need time to go into the mode of goodness also periodically. So that we are not just consumed in getting things done. We, we are also checking whether we are getting important things done. It's important to get things done, but it's important to also get important things done. So, in passion, we will definitely get things done. But we'll get so consumed in getting things done that we'll not be checking whether we are getting important things done. And that's why, in some ways, having a, a Shastric study, this is also something which is not necessarily deadline driven. Bhagavatam is there to study. Bhagavatam is so big. One day I will start. And what happens? That one day never comes. <laughs> one day. So, <clears throat> that's why often having some kind of say structure for our Shastri study, having Bhakti Shastri, having Bhakti Vaibhav, or having some classes like this, where you are expected every, every week to read some two hours. Shastri study is Sattvic, but we are such that, without some rajas, we can't even do sattva. <laughs> without some passion, we can't do your activity with goodness. So, it's the activity of studying scriptures and goodness. But unless we, if you want to get something done, because we are so much in passion, we need to infuse some rajas in it. So, we don't want to be taken over by mode of passion entirely. But just... One day I will come to the mode of goodness and I will do activities in goodness. It will never happen. So better that, okay, I am in passion right now, but I want to do activities in goodness. Let me do that and say, let me have some amount of rajas in it. So as I again said, we shouldn't demonize any mode. Every mode has its utility. So, <clears throat> the... So, as I said, Sattvam Sukhei Sanjayati Rajaha Karmani Bharata. So, in the mode of goodness, we feel peaceful, we feel calm, we feel reflective, we feel satisfied with our life. In the mode of passion, we are driven by desire to do things. And again, after Krishna, after giving this perspective from long term to medium term to short term, then again he concludes his discussion by giving a long term perspective. He says, Urdhvam Gachyanti Sattvastha Madhye Tishthanti Rajasa Jagan Jaguna Vrittistha so this is 40.18. Those who are situated in goodness will get elevated. Then those who are passion will then in stasis. And those who are in ignorance will be in will be degraded. Degraded can refer to lower planets, it can refer to lower species, whichever way it might be. Overall to lower consciousness. And then after talking about this, now Krishna talks about how can we functionally use all this knowledge? So he says that to, after you understand all these moods, understand Nanyam Gudebhya Kartaram Yadadrashtanu Pashyati Gudebhya Shaparam Vetti Madbhavam Sodhi Gachyati He says that actually it is the moods who are the doers. It is the, we are not the doers, the moods are the doers. Apart from the mood there is no doer and the soul is the observed. Of course the soul is not just the observer, the soul is the chooser. Soul is the chooser of the various objects. So it's like say, uh, if you are say playing some video game on TV, and say that's a you're driving a car, the Grand Auto Theft or something like that, some game you are playing, and then uh, you have you come to a road, you want to take lane A, lane B, lane C. Now once you choose a lane A, you can't go on the road of lane B. So basically, we choose lane A, and then the, the whole mesh the the software and the hardware of the, so of the software of the computer, the video game, that rushes, races our car along that particular lane. So now everything that happens within the video game, we are not exactly doing that. We are choosing, once we choose, things start zooming up accordingly. 
So we could say this principle over here is, and Krishna says we are not the doers. What it, but he says, Nanya mune pe kata yada drashtan vajini. Mune pe shcha param vitti. We are transcendental. What that means is, we are forced to do as we choose to desire. We are forced to do what we choose to desire. Once we accept a particular desire, this is what I want to do. And suppose an alcoholic is thinking, I'll not drink, I'll drink, I'll not drink, I'll drink. You know, okay, I'm going to drink. Then after that, like a force takes them over and drags them towards drinking. So we, uh, we are, once we choose, after that the control is lost from our hands. Of course, it's not entirely lost. We can pull back, but we get pulled by the modes very much. That's what Krishna is saying. Understand that you are the chooser. And if you can go beyond the mode, he says you can go beyond the cycle of birth and death. So that's what Krishna said in the beginning of the chapter that those who understand this knowledge, they will, they will go beyond the cycle of birth and death. That's what Krishna concludes in 40.20 when he says, Udhane Tanati Tastrim Dehi Deha Samudbhavan Janmam Tujara Dukhai Vimukto Amrita Vashnute Vimukto They become liberated. So at 40.20, Krishna has completed his discussion. And then Arjuna asks three questions. And what comes afterwards is the answer to those three questions. So, are there any questions? Am I overwhelming all of you? <laughs> Oh, 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 okay. We can go to the class. Okay, I'll, I'll try to quickly complete it then. In five, five, seven, 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 the question is, my question, when I was talking to Gandhi Shantani earlier, he said, ask the question, how do you do that? So the what, the, the answer to that, how do you overcome it, is through devotion. So okay, I'll talk, about it. Yeah, I'll talk about it. Okay, sure. So, in 40.21, Arjun asks basically three questions. Kair linga is trin guna anetan atito bhavati prabho kimachara katham chaitam strin guna anati vartate. So he says, what are the characteristics of one who is transcendent the moods? Kai linga is The word linga can refer to gender and linga can also refer to characteristic. So, when a baby is newborn, there's a certain characteristic by which the gender is determined. So, linga can refer to both. So, kai linga refers to what is the characteristic in terms of a behavior. Trin guna netan atito bhavati prabho. One who is transcendent the moods. So one is for oneself, how can I know internally what is the consciousness by which the modes are transcended? Second is, what is the behavior? Kim If somebody else is transcended or not, how do I know that? I look at their behavior. And a third is, Katam Chaitams. How to transcend? The three questions, this is 14.21. And the first question is answered in 22 and 23. Kai Linga is, is answered in 22 and 23. Kim is answered in 24 25. And Katam Chaitams, how to transcend that's answered in 26. <clears throat> now, when Krishna talks about how to transcend the modes, the first thing he says is very interesting. Prakasham cha pravrittim cha moham eva cha pandava nadveshti samprattani nanavrittani kaangshati udasina vadasinam gunayriyona vichalyate gunavartan dityeva yogatishthi nengate He says, now Prakasha pravritti moha, these are three modes. Krishna says, and when their influence comes, don't get carried away by it. Don't resent it, don't rejoice it. Just observe it. Krishna is telling, become an observer of your thoughts, an observer of your emotions. And udasinavad asinam. Udasinavad means as if detached. So in English there are two words. There is uninterested and there is disinterested. Does anyone know the difference between the two words? Or you are not interested? <laughs> yes. Attached. You're either attached to it or you're not. Okay, disinterested. He's not, you're not attached. To uninterested? You're attached to it. No, no, uninterested, they're the same. Yes, yes, sorry. Yes. Okay, so actually the difference is disinterested means having no vested interests, like impartial. 
and uninterested means having no interest at all. So, say it. So, Krishna is called Udasinavad, as if detached. So, Krishna says, be disinterested, not uninterested. Say, so consider a cricket match is going on. And there is the umpire right in the middle of the action. And then the ballers, ball bowls the ball, the ball goes and hits the foot of the player. And the batsman, the, all the players are how's that? And the umpire says, I was not watching the match, I'm not interested. <laughs> What are you doing here? You cannot be, the, you cannot be uninterested, isn't it? But the umpire has to be disinterested. If the umpire is in favor of the bowling team, every appeal out, 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 out. <laughs> that will not do. So the umpire has to be interested, but also disinterested. Interested in the sense that he has to observe, but disinterested is impartial. So Krishna is saying similarly. <coughs> become a disinterested observer of your thoughts and emotions. See, when we say our mind is our enemy, we should, we should not listen to the mind. But we can't always say no to everything the mind is saying. That's why I talk about self-discipline and self-discovery. Certain suggestions the mind comes up with, we say certain desires, no. But certain things, yes. So it's like when the players appeal, the umpire doesn't have a default response, yes or no. The umpire evaluates on merit. Similarly, when thoughts and desires come up within us, we evaluate on merit. That's what Krishna is saying. If you understand you are a soul different from your body and mind, then you can, you can evaluate on merit. <coughs> he says that be situated as the soul and observe your emotions. When you can do this, then you will not get carried away by the emotions. An important point to understand in this is that sometimes we start feeling, okay, how can I just observe? These modes are so strong. I mean, when a particular desire comes, it's going to grow and grow. How can I just keep observing it? That's the secret over here. That our desires, when they come up, the urges that come up, say lust or anger or greed or envy or whatever, say an alcoholic gets the urge to drink, whatever. Now, these urges are not like endlessly rising lines. They increase, 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 increase. We feel it's going to increase, increase, increase. And I'll have to give up eventually. So because I have to give up eventually, let me give up immediately. We think like that. No. Actually, they rise, but they are not like endlessly rising lines. They are like endlessly recurring waves. The wave will rise to a particular point, it will come to a crest and then it will go down, come to a drop. Again it will rise, but again it will go down. So another example we could use for this is, so we just have to resist it till it rises, rises, rises. After some time it will subside. But most of the time, we don't resist it till that time. When we start becoming strong, 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 this is what we too strong, I can't resist it, resist it and we give up. But if you resist it, the crest will go down and come to the drop. Another example could be that, say if you are playing an arm wrestling match. In an arm wrestling match, suppose the other person is very powerful. Almost got our arm to the ground now. And we think, how long can I hold on? And we just give up. But suppose it's a timed arm wrestling match. So you, know, you have to get the other person's arm down in say three minutes. And if you can't get in, then this round is over, it's a draw, then start in the next round. So like that, now our hand might be almost down. But if you can just survive the current round, three minutes get over, then we won't start here. We'll start on neutral ground. We'll start from here again. So similarly for us, when the modes come, no mode stays forever. So we could say, our dealing with each mode is like one round. One round we are dealing with it. And when Krishna says, just tolerate it, just observe, stay detached. That means don't get carried away. It's not going to last forever. When we feel bored, when we feel lazy, we just don't feel like doing anything. Yes, that feeling will come, but it's not going to be there forever. Just, just go through it, just live, live through it. So if we just survive the present round, we will resume on neutral ground neutral ground. 
So this is how we can become an observer. Like the players are appealing. And the player keeps appealing, keeps appealing, keeps appealing. And the umpire says, this player is appealing so much, if I don't give out, the player will keep appealing, so let me give out. No, the umpire, the player can't keep appealing. The umpire says, no, the player has to start playing again. Isn't it? So our emotions can appeal to us, but we can, we can resist their appeals. So understanding our own spirituality helps us recognize that we, we are different from our emotions. And we can choose our emotions, choose to accept them or choose to reject them. And then Krishna says, how do you know that some people are actually, have transcended the modes? It is by, when we see that they stay equipoise. Sukha dukha samasvastha samaloshta shmakanchana. That he says, in happiness, in distress, in honor, dishonor, they stay equipoised. Now it's interesting, Krishna, if they don't feel happiness, distress, then they won't even know it is happiness, distress. Isn't it? It's not that they don't feel it. And another place Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita 5.20 that, Na praharishet priyam prapya, no dvijet prapya cha priyam. He says, do not be elated when there is happiness and do not be dejected when there is distress. So Krishna is saying here that you will experience some things as enjoy, happy and some things as, as unhappiness. Something as pleasant, something as unpleasant. We can't, we can't wish away our experience. So some people are just a joy to be with. And some people are, are a pain to be with. Hmm? Now, now we can't deny the emotion that we feel. But we don't have to get carried away by that emotion. So Krishna is saying, if somebody can stay equipoised, then they have transcended the mood. And then, how do we get there? So one thing I talk about is just my self-observation. But then Krishna says, Mamchayo vyavicharena bhakti yogena sevate sagunan samati tiyaitan brahma guvyaya kalpate that If you become fixed in bhakti, then you can transcend the modes. Now we may wonder, it is because of the modes only I can't be fixed in bhakti. Because the, mode is, because the mode of ignorance is so strong, I can't wake up in the morning. Because the mode of passion is so strong, I don't feel like sitting and studying Shastra or chanting or whatever else. So the modes are what is coming in the way of bhakti. So how can I be fixed in bhakti and thereby go beyond the modes? So it's like, uh, it's like the old chicken and egg question. What comes first, the chicken or the egg? Well, whatever you have. Start with it. <laughs> if you have a chicken, lay an egg. If you have an egg, Get a chicken. <laughs> <laughs> so, how do, we, how do we work? We work with whatever we have right now. So, if I say that, okay, I cannot wake up at 4 o'clock in the morning. Okay, then what time can you wake up here? That's why I said self-discovery and self-discipline. So, we could say, I cannot be fixed in bhakti at this level. But I can be fixed in bhakti at this level. I can be fixed in bhakti at this level. So we connect with Krishna as much as we can right now. And through that fixed connection, gradually our purity will increase. And then we can expand that connection. That means somebody says, Oh, okay, I, I find this, I don't like this, I don't find this so I find this too difficult. Okay, what do you like to do in bhakti? What can you do, become, what one thing can you become fixed in bhakti? Okay, you know, I can come to the temple once a week. Okay, make that as a fixed commitment. Other things also we want to do, but if there's something which we like to do, then doing it will not be an austerity. I'll conclude, this is the partial answer to your question. I'll conclude with this. See, there is emotion and there is reason within us. We have certain emotions and we have a logical faculty. So when Krishna is telling, become an observer of your emotions, it's like use reason. And this emotion is not good, this desire is not good, this thought is not good, I will not do it. So we have emotion and we have reason. And if there is a battle between emotion and reason, we say we should try to be rational, we try to be reasonable. But sometimes the emotions are too powerful. So in the battle between emotion and reason, if we have only reason on the spiritual side and emotion on the material side or the mental side, we will not be able to sustain our spirituality. But what bhakti does is, bhakti gets emotion also on the spiritual side. How does bhakti do that? 
कि विद इन भक्ति फाइंड आउट समथिंग दैट यू लाइक टू एंड मेक दैट मोर एंड मोर एक्सेसिबल टू योर सपोज समी लाइक स्क्यूपल्स then just make you memorize your favorite tunes or keep some of your favorite kirtis kirtans with you so when the lower mode start hitting us when passion start hitting us when ignorance start hitting us so it's like the hand has almost gone down it's just not able to resist anymore at that time if we have to think reasonably logically it will be very difficult because we are so much caught in the battle but if we could at that time do connect our consciousness with something which you like to do If anger or desire or what is overwhelming us, we may find at that time philosophy difficult to think. But if we have our favorite picture of favorite picture of Krishna Darshan, just look at that. Immediately, we feel some devotion, we feel some connection. Or if we like some kirtan, if we like some shlokas, then just keep those shlokas, maybe a recording of those shlokas or the print of those shlokas, and just recite that. Just recite that. So by that, what will happen? We will get. Our some some emotion will more spiritual yours. So once the spiritual connection is established, then the material emotion that is pulling us by the modes that we can decrease it. So Rupa Goswami, in his Bhakti Rasam, in his Ujjwal Nila Mani, which is like the next book after Bhakti Rasam Sindhu, he calls this as Uddipan. Uddipan means spiritual stimulus. See, all of us have certain sensual stimuli that agitate us. Somebody say who is in a country like America, for them cricket is usually refers to an insect. So you say cricket match is going on. What? Two crickets are fighting with each other. <laughs> <laughs> see, a cricket match is going on. That may not agitate them at all. But for them, baseball or basketball, that's very big. They may get agitated by that. So just like in the world, we have certain sensual stimuli that agitate us, and those stimuli may not agitate the other person. So just as there are particular st- sensual stimuli for each pe- each person, similarly there can be particular spiritual stimuli for each person. So we find those spiritual stimuli that can connect us with Krishna, and we try to become fixed in that. Mamcha yoga vichare na bhakti yoga na same thing. So unflinchingly connect with that. Or some people, some people actually like philosophy. They like to hear classes of our. Class in general classes or classes of a particular devotee or class one a particular subject, a particular pastime. Then what we like, we keep that accessible to us. So there is self discipline, but there is also self discovery. So this is what I like. Then I'll use this to gain gain strength and to resist doing what I don't like. So if we become fixed in one activity of bhakti, gradually that will lead to purification, and that purification will enable us to become fixed in other activities in bhakti also. and that's how we can transcend the modes and ultimately krishna says that by by practicing bhakti you come to the brahman platform the brahman platform is the abode of lasting happiness so sukham atyant the ultimate happiness is the brahman platform now that can be just by understanding us in the soul understanding us in the parts of krishna all the eternal happiness is at the spiritual level so in this way krishna concludes this chapter by telling us how both through self observation and through devotion through self observation and through devotion we can transcend the modes so thank you very much so let's quickly take some questions how do you differentiate between the mind and the intelligence ultimately <clears throat> taxonomy is always very <coughs> no water tight categories so like if you go to if you see the world map this is america this is canada but if you go there it's not that there is a clean dividing line on the topography that this is america this is canada so in general we could say that so what is mind what is intelligence you know, there is no we don't have inner eye which we can see and there are no inner boxes this is mind speaking this is intelligence speaking so broadly what we can see is to, dif- to functionally differentiate between the two is see not where something is coming from but where something is taking us so if something is taking us in a direction which we know from past experience is unhealthy then we can presume it is coming from the mind if something is taking us towards a positive direction we can say it is coming from the intelligence that's a functional way to differentiate now 
should we become a should we master the mind or become a master mind? Okay, that was actually this is I think the words are very different over here. So the word mind we use it in a very different sense from what uh, it's used in the world. It's you may say that Einstein was one of the greatest minds of the last century. Now where we here we use the word mind, it refers to basically intellectual capacity, an intelligent person. Mm -hmm. Or sometimes when we use the word, have you lost your mind? There, what do you mean? It's not that your mind has fallen away and you don't know where it is. The mind is not physical object. Have you lost your mind? There it means you are referring to mind as in good sense. Mm -hmm. Or we also say, give this your full mind. Then we are using the word mind to refer to attention. Give this your attention. So the word mind has different meanings. So when we say master the mind, that simply means that <coughs> the, the, the impulsive force which comes up within us, which goes for short-sighted pleasure, short-sighted drives, vindictiveness, that which is short-term within us, learn to restrain it. That is master the mind. Whereas master mind refers to somebody who is very expert in a particular field. So somebody might be a, a mastermind in say management, somebody might be a mastermind in leadership, somebody might be a mastermind in painting, whatever. So mastermind usually refers to some extraordinary talented capacity with which somebody is able to do some things in life. So if we are if we are if, if a spiritual master is given service which is not aligned to our nature, like preaching for an introvert, no, it's not that simple. Why? Because generally understanding our nature also takes some time. If we ask our our mind, what is my nature? What is the service according to my nature? The mind will say, whatever service you are doing now, that is not according to your nature. <laughs> <coughs> so, even presuming that my service is not according to my nature, that could also be a trick of the mind. Thinking that this is not according to my nature, that could also be a trick of the mind. Because understanding our nature also takes some time. So, broadly speaking, we... Uh, we when we are trying to practice bhakti, we learn the principle of submission and discipline. Try to do whatever service we are told to do as much as we can. But while doing services, we observe ourselves. Okay, in this service, I am good at doing. This service, I also am comfortable doing it. So when Krishna says, guna karma vibhaga shaha, guna and karma, uh, I put in contemporary terms as competence and comfort. So if I am comfortable doing something, and I am competent at doing something. Because we can indicate that is broadly according to our nature. And so gradually we can gravitate towards that service. So initially we may just be told to do what we are told to do. But if you see long run, the spiritual master wants us to learn the principle of obedience. But the spiritual master also wants us to be happily situated in bhakti. And to be sustainably situated in bhakti. So if you are doing a service according to nature, you can do it for a long time. So there can be discussion, negotiation, and you get tell, I can do this service, I'll be do it, but I feel inspired to do this, can I do this? You can, you can talk with our authorities. And usually, it's not that the spiritual master will deliberately tell us to do something which is not against our nature, which is against our nature. So if you talk, I talk and understand and explore, we can gradually gravitate towards the service according to our nature. And it's not that introverts can't preach. Actually, there are different kinds of preaching. There's some kind of preaching which requires one to be like a charismatic crowd puller. So generally, introverts may find that difficult. But there is also preaching which is where your people are more educational, you are more of an educator. Say like, say, say something like Bhakti Shastri course or even systematic scriptural study. You don't need to be an extrovert for that. Because that time you can study and you can discuss deeply subjects. So we don't have to think that preaching is not for extroverts. There are, the same service can be different done in different ways. Like when an introvert may distribute books, but the way an introvert distributes books will be different from the way an extrovert distributes books. So we shouldn't equate a service with a particular nature. That will happen when we equate a service with a particular way of doing service. There's a difference. Some devotees, when they give class, it's like they're so animated, it's a performance. Some devotees, when they give a class, nothing except their mouth is moving. <laughs> <laughs> now, 
classes can be given in different ways. The important thing is that you be effective. So we don't have to necessarily equate. So the, the way an extrovert may preach may not be the way an introvert preaches. But we can, if we can communicate the message, we can connect with people, then we can do that service in our own way. Okay. Yes, please. Is it hard to understand ourselves if we have mind? If we say sometimes we should do self discovery, that means do we listen to our mind? And when that, that is right, when that is wrong? The first thing is life never comes with a guarantee of right decisions. If you wait for the right decision, we will wait for the right for the rest of eternity. Because we are finite beings and we can never have absolute certainty about anything. So we just use whatever intelligence, whatever knowledge we have, and we we just do the best that we can. So if we find after some time that okay, I did this, but that didn't work out so well. So I we change that. We choose a particular service because I, I feel like doing it. So what we could do to prevent being carried away by the mind is that not just change services based on emotions. I say if I decide to do a particular service. Then commit for some finite time, maybe three months, six months, one month at least, one year, whatever. Whatever my mind says, now I'm going to do this service. And maybe after three months or six months, okay, you know, I feel very, this is very good. I also felt very happy, and I was also able to do service. Then I can continue that. Or if I feel okay, it was not, it was quite an austerity. I still do that austerity <coughs> for three months, whatever. Then you change over to something else. So that way. We use our intelligence as much as, much as we can to plan. Mm -hmm. This is what I'm going to do. And then do it the best we can. And then, that's why you could say there is self-discovery initially when we're doing a particular thing. Just think and then do decide what I'm going to do. But when you're doing it, have self-discipline. Just have self-discipline at that. Do it. The, the, we don't make such an extreme resolution that we can't keep it. But just some in a moderate way what is possible. We do it. And then, after the, that finite period is complete, then again have self-observation, self self-discovery. For self So that way, we could have this alternate. Otherwise, if you're constantly trying to do both things, we will end up doing nothing. So there is, when you're doing self-discipline, just focus on self-discipline. When you're doing self-discovery, focus on self-discovery. That way, by separating the two, we'll be able to move forward. Okay? And certain guidance helps if we can have somebody with whom we can talk, and they can tell us from their perspective. It could be a friend, it could be a family member, it could be a spiritual guide. Uh, if we have somebody with whom we can talk and uh, understand ourselves better, it's good because you know, we, do, we don't just think by thinking. We also think by talking. You know, so thinking by writing is also, journaling is also helpful. So just to think inside the head is, is can be quite confusing. We start thinking inside the head, we get lost inside the head sometimes. So either write it down, talk with someone, that also helps. And don't worry so much it's a wrong decision or right decision, because that conclusion, conclusiveness we can never have. We just do the best that we can. Will we eventually come to a time where we start getting internal guidance about how best to use our time in Krishna's service? Yeah, we will broadly get an understanding of ourselves good enough to know what we should do and we should not do. It will not be like a 
black and white kind of understanding. But at least broadly we'll understand. But this is this is a service which I don't know how to get into right now. This I want to do. Maybe I can consider it. So as we understand ourselves more and more, it's not that everything will just come by spontaneous clear guidance. But there are some things which you'll understand. This is not for me. And I don't want to get involved in this. This I really want to do this. And we can also observe ourselves by that we can see what, what interests us the most. It's, I have a whole seminar on discovering our purpose in life. So I talk about three things, I call it seminar and I talk about three broad principles. You know, that there is <coughs> a problem, there is a potential and there is a process. That means in the world out there, there is something wrong which I feel I need to fix. Or which, which, which I feel needs to be fixed. The world is a very big place, I can't fix the world. Even in our, our own movement, our own community, there are so many things which could be improved. But there is some problem which we feel strongly about. This needs to be fixed. So that we, we look at the world and when we look at things, what do we strongly feel? Like? This should be done better. Then secondly, potential. Do I have the ability to do it? Otherwise I just keep complaining, this is bad, this is bad. So look at a problem, look at an issue that we feel strongly about. Look at yourself to see whether we have the resources, we have the ability to deal with that. And third is the process. Now I, I should also have, I might feel that, okay, I, you know, I want to have DT worship, you know, our kirtans can be done much better. And I have singing ability also. But then, you know, maybe I don't have the process, who should I approach? You know, I can't just, somebody else is doing kirtan, I can't pick the kirtan, I can start singing over there. So maybe I have to approach the right authority, so process. So we look at these three things broadly, a problem that we feel strongly about, a potential that we have and we can develop, and a process for using that potential to solve that problem. So by that, gradually we can discover our purpose in life. And it's not necessary that we have to always have the best purpose. See, even a suboptimal purpose is better than no purpose. And we work on suboptimal purposes, right? And gradually we have to work on a more optimal purpose also. Any other questions? Okay, yes. Can you give a live example for uh, separating the self-discovery and self-discipline? Okay. A live dis example for separating self-discipline and self-discovery. Say some devotees try to do management. And after they do management, others have to manage them. <laughs> They get so stressed and worked up that more than the service, the person becomes a source of stress for others. <laughs> so maybe, you know, don't do management. So we all need to take some amount of uh, st st stress in our service. Some amount of challenge. But you know there is this concept of comfort zone, stretch zone and panic zone. So the idea is if I can lift 10 kg weight and I'll go and lift 1 kg weight. There's no hard in exercise and comfort zone. If I lift 11-12 kg weight, that's some exercise, that's like a stretch zone. But if I try to lift 50 kg weight, I'll get crushed. So we all want to take challenges, but we have to see whether the challenge stimulates us or challenges burdens us, agitates us, irritates us. So that's how if something is just too agitating for us and too agitating for others, then we can say that this is, we discover that this is what I am not so good at doing. Sometimes uh, we do something, hey, this worked out so well. I didn't know I was good at this. So basically, by seeing how much, how well we are able to do it, comfort and competence at all, by that we can separate the self-discovery self -discover, self -discover, self -discover and self-discipline. Does it make sense? Thank you. Yeah, so. Okay, what if, what if other priorities consume us even if we don't want to be consumed? We want to be in goodness, but then we want to, we find ourselves pushed into passion. So we can't begin in our life unless we begin with our life. We can't begin in our life, I want to do this, I want to do that. But we have to begin with our life. 
So if our current priorities, our current situations require a certain amount of passion, we just try to wish I want to be good at this. And that's not going to help. Begin where you are. So then <clears throat> all of us can create, say if I find that out of 12 hour, 10 hours of work that I do, 12 hours of work, whatever I do, out of that you know, most of the time I need to be passionate. Okay, then try to create maybe some half an hour, one hour, 15 minutes of time where you try to be in goodness. And gradually that may increase. So we don't have to, we can't reject a situation that we are in right now. We have to work with that situation. But we don't have to let that situation control us completely. In life, sometimes we are in, um, say life is like a tennis match. So in a tennis match, sometimes you are serving and sometimes you are returning. And when we are returning, at that time we have very little control. The, the player might have very good forehand, but the ball comes on the backhand. And the player says, my forehand is so good, I'll hit on the forehand. Well, you will only hit air. At that time, the player has to play on the backhand and somehow get the ball back into play. And once you get the ball back into play, then eventually you may be able to play on the forehand also. So when a player is returning, they have far, they have far greater constraints. But they don't have to keep returning all the time. Eventually they will be serving also. So sometimes we are in a situation in life when we are returning. <coughs> so when we are returning, our situations are constrained. <coughs> and there are players, there are players who have become Grand Slam champions simply by their expertise on returning. Very good returners. And so it's not, so even working within constrained situations can also help us grow. And that's how we can also move forward in our life. So yes, if my situation requires me mostly to be passionate, accept that. But within that, create some pocket of goodness for yourself. Maybe the future situation will change and there can be more goodness afterwards. Okay. So, shall we stop here? So, very intelligent way of signaling by turning off that. <laughs> Thank you very much. Shri Mad Bhagavad Gita ki. Yeah. Shri Prabhupada ki. Yeah. Gaur Bhakta Vinda ki. Yeah. Dai Gaur Premanand ki. Yeah.